Greetings and welcome back. We now are in AP English and we are now in the pivotal moment in Republic, Republic 7. And our interests now finally are to get to the answer of the myth of Maverick. We're finally here to this moment when Socrates will turn to Glaucon and say, let's really answer your question. I should point out, and Mike Segru as the Platonist scholar has pointed this out, that it takes a long time for a serious student to get through Republic 1-6 to finally get to Republic 7. Let's point out that Plato's playing games the whole time with the student reader. So for example, in Republic 6, Plato will say, see, Socrates has given you the answer. The answer to the myth of Maverick was this two-box theory that we put on the board, the difference between a beautiful face and, a be and beauty itself. There, done. Glaucon is forever, however, the right kind of student. He admits his ignorance. He admits that he doesn't quite see how the theory of the forms is the answer to the myth of Maverick. Now, just to remind, that money drops onto the floor. The old lady does not see the money drops onto the floor. You have an immediate choice to make that for Socrates is a moral dilemma. Okay, that's how he thinks of it. How do I respond? Glaucon will say, any human being, I hate to say this, he says, about humans, but he says any human being is going to take that money. The only reason he or she won't take the money is fear of getting caught or the promise of some kind of reward. You remove both of those obstacles, and you're no longer going to be worrying at all about turning the money and not turning the money, and you're going to take that money. So now Socrates will hear Glaucon's question, and he will say, all right, look, I can answer the myth of Maverick, the question we posed. Why would you give the money back every time, regardless of, uh, of situation? And, more particularly and almost impossibly, you're going to actually enjoy doing it, as opposed to, geez, I wish I could have the 5000 instead of giving it back to the nasty old lady. That's going to now be where Socrates will turn, and he will say, I can give you a solid answer, but I'm going to have to tell you a seriously whacked out story. To which Glaucon says, dude, you're always telling us seriously whacked out stories. I mean, if you read all of the Platonist uh, dialogues, you will see Socrates is always telling weird whacked out stories. Socrates says, no, 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 you don't understand. This is the most whacked out kind of story. Are you okay with that? To which Glaucon's like, good student that he is, yes. Socrates says, now this is what we call an allegory. Now, we've been playing this game of allegory. I am in book seven now of Republic. This is, as we've already said, this is the most famous section of Republic, seven. And we call this the allegory of the cave. All right, the allegory of the cave. No single word picture becomes more important in the history of Western thought. Once you know this word picture, you will begin to immediately identify the way it gets played, recapitulated, repeated, over and over again in the history of thought. So Socrates begins. He says to Glaucon, it's kind of a three-part story, so stay with me and really focus. At this point, you really don't have to take much for notes. If this word picture works, it works because you don't forget it and you won't forget it. That's the point. Socrates gives you a word picture that you will never forget. Once you hear it, it's not like you're ever going to forget it, okay? Really? Well, I don't know. I'll share it with you. You tell me, okay? Here's the beginning of it. He says, imagine a bunch of people who are stuck in a cave. Allow for that to represent the wall of the cave. These people are stuck in this cave in a very strange way. They are chained up so that they can't get up and walk around and they can only see side to side and forward. They can't see behind them. Blackcomb's like, well, that's kind of weird. So he's like, no, no, I'm not even halfway finished. Behind those people sitting chained up is a little walkway. Behind the walkway is a fire burning. From outside of the cave, referenced as line, somebody comes walking, people come walking through they, uh, through the cave in twos, in pairs, and they're talking. Glaucon is then asked, what will happen on the wall of the cave as these interlocutors, these speakers, walk 
in front of the fire. Glaucon's pretty sharp, and he's like, well, if these people walk in front of the fire, there's light. The light will, of course, project onto the wall shadows. Right? I mean, right? Shadows projected onto the wall. Socrates says, yeah, you're, you're, you're right, Glaucon. I appreciate it. But now Socrates asks Glaucon a really interesting question. He says, about the shadows on the wall, what will the people sitting chained up think about those shadows? And Glaucon's like, well, I, 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 I guess they would probably have to think of them as somehow real. Correct? Think about it. They can't get up and go up to the wall of the cave and touch the shadows to know that they're not real. Remember, they're chained. They can't turn around and see because they can't look behind them. So they don't know about the existence of fire, and to that degree, they can't see the people walking either. Everything about their senses tells them that what they see on the wall of the cave is real. They've got no reason to know otherwise. They've got no sense of what's going on behind them. They have no sense of it at all. To that degree, they can hear and they can see two of their five senses, correct? And that tells them without any shadow of doubt, those things are real. Glaucon's like, this is the answer to the myth of Maverick question? Socrates is like, wait, 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 I'm not done yet. Now there's the next part of the story. There's more? Oh yeah, there's more. From outside of the cave, referenced as X with circle, someone will come into the cave. He walks into the cave and he walks up to one of the youngest, as referenced by X with box. He walks, up to, he walks up to one of the youngest. By the way, that'll be kind of significant for our story. He walks up to one of the youngest and he says, I got something to tell you and you're not going to believe me, but it's true. This stuff that you're looking at on the wall of the cave, it ain't real. And the kid's like, dude, what are you talking about? Are you like stoned or something? And the guy says, all right, I'm done telling you. I'm going to show you. And he actually unchains this kid. He turns him around and has him look at the fire. He shows him that these people are walking. And he says, these things on the wall, they're called shadows. They're not real. At this point, Socrates asks Glaucon, question, how do you imagine this kid responds to this guy? And Glaucon's like, well, I'm sure he says, whoa, blow my mind. What else do you have to show me about this world I thought was so real? What else do you have to tell me? Socrates says, way wrong answer. That is not at all what the kid says. Glaucon's like, what are you talking about? Nope, not at all what the kid says. What the kid says is, you are a troublemaker. You need to turn me around, chain me back up. I want to look at these things on the wall called shadows some more. Leave me alone. Glaucon's like, Nobody would say that. Socrates is like, dude, I'm telling the story. That's what he says. Glaucon's like, well, is that what he does? Does he turn around, chain him back up? No, 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 no. That's not what he does at all. What he does is he grabs the kid by the hair, kicking and screaming, and he drags the kid out of the cave. Kid does not want to go. Kid's like, leave me alone. Go ahead. Nope. The guy drags him out of the cave, kicking and screaming out of the cave, into the light of the sun. Of course, the minute that he comes out of the cave, where it's been dark, into the light of the sun, he is, of course, blinded by the light. Socrates, of course, Plato will invent the phrase at this moment, and it will forever become a major phrase in Western thought. He's blinded by the light. Of course, the kid's like, Dude, I can't see it. Oh, this is great. Oh, thanks for the help. Down in the cave, I was at least able to see. Now I'm totally blind. Wow, you've done a great service for me. To which, of course, the guy who drug him out of the cave says, hang on a second. Give it some time. Slowly, your eyes are going to begin to grow more accustomed to the light. And as you do, you're going to start to see some things that are going to blow your ever-loving mind. Slowly, 
first you'll see just kind of vague things, shapes, and slowly your eyes are going to grow accustomed, and before long, well, sure enough, this is what happens. Before long, this kid's eyes start to grow accustomed to the light, and he realizes in a powerful epiphany, a powerful moment, he realizes, oh, I've been stuck in a cave all my life, looking at shadows on a wall thinking they were real. And in fact, finally, when his eyes can grow accustomed to it, he can't actually look directly at the sun and the light of the sun, but he's at least aware that the light of the sun kind of simulates the light of the fire in the cave, only it's far brighter. Whoa, those things on the wall are totally shadows. There isn't anything that's real about those things on the wall. I thought they were real, and they ain't real at all. Socrates pauses for a moment, Glaucon's it's like, this is the answer to the myth of Maverick? What, are you kidding me? Socrates is like, I'm not quite finished with the story yet. There's more to this whacked out story? One more part. It's the interesting question of, what does the kid do once he comes out of the cave and he now sees, as referenced by Triangle, okay? What does he do? Well, Glaucon's like, I, I don't know. He like goes to Cozumel for the rest of his life and hangs out by the beach and enjoys the sun because he's been living in a cave all his life. Way wrong answer, Socrates says. You missed it again. Falcon's like, well, what does he do? Socrates says, he turns around and he goes back down into the cave. The only problem is the minute he enters the darkness of the cave, he can't see anything, right? So he's kind of walking into the cave. He's bumping his head on the ceiling. He's walking into the wall. And he comes in there. He's all excited. He even runs in there. He's like, hey, you guys, I've got great news. I've got great news. You're not going to believe what I've discovered. Outside, there's this thing called the sun. It's so, these things you're looking at, we've always been looking at. They're shadows. They're not real. And Socrates asked God, how do you imagine these guys respond? Yay! Yay! Why don't you unchain all of us and we can go out to... No, no. They say about this to this guy, you are a troublemaker, stay far away from us. We don't want to hear anything you have to say. Of course, in some cultures, crucifixion happens. <coughs> they shot him okay, right? Sometimes that's the way it goes, right? What does he do though? Well, he goes up to another one, the youngest, one of the younger, again, does the same gig, shows him. Again, the same response, leave me alone, you're a troublemaker. Out, drag it into the light. We can kind of see, recapitulate it over and over. End of story. End of story. And it's almost as if Socrates now goes like one of these. Okay, so there you go. There's your answer to the myth of Maverick. Now can we get on to another conversation? And Glaucon's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm sorry, you just told a really strange story about people locked inside of a cave and somebody coming in and emancipating one of them, the youngest, and out in the, out in the light he goes, and then he goes back into the cave again and he's ridiculed for it? That's the answer? That is your answer to $5,000 drops on a floor? What, are you kidding me? Socrates is like, okay, so this is called an analogy, which means the story means something. So let's play the game of what it means and answer the myth of Maverick. And it will be somewhere in the explanation that Glaucon goes, oh, as all readers of Republic 7 will go, oh, let's just play the game. Behind the counter, it's not you, it's a kid. Now, it's a kid, it's not you. And the kid has been on video the whole time, and you've been watching. Sure enough, the money fell. Sure enough, the old lady left. Sure enough, the kid comes around. Yes, 5,000, yes. Good day to be at work. Sets it on the counter for a couple of hours, waiting, waiting, then puts it inside of his pocket. And he's actually cleaning the hot dog machine just a few minutes before he leaves to go home from work to spend his five bones. And you walk in. Bell rings. Kid turns around. Yeah, can I do anything for you? And you say, um, yeah, uh, uh, I need to talk to you. And the kid's like, w what about? Well, I, I know something. I, I know I know about what's in your I know about what's in your pocket. It's like, dude, what are you talking about? Don't worry, I'm not busting you or nothing. I I, I know, okay? I, there's this video. See, it's like on the camera. See, the kid's like, you, dude, you're not getting my money. I, I won that fair and square. That old babe, she was nasty to me anyway. You clearly saw that on the video. So the money is mine. You're not getting my money. And you go, yeah, no, I'm I'm not interested in your money. 
You're not interested in my money. No, just take it out of your pocket for a second, though. And the kid reaches in, takes it out, and you say, here's the thing I want to tell you about that money. It ain't real. It ain't real. <laughs> and the kid goes, dude, I don't know what you're stoning on, but you need to just stay away from me. This is my bank. You ain't getting it. And you go, whoa, 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 whoa. You did not hear me. You need to listen to me. That money ain't real. It ain't real. The kid like looks at it again like, you mean it's like monopoly money or something? Oh, no, no, it's valid currency. It's 5,000 U.S. currency. It's real. But it ain't real. And the kid says what? Oh, that's mine. Hey, what else do you have you can teach me? That's incredible. I want to learn more. What else do you... No. No. The kid says what? Dude, I don't know about you. And I don't know what like planet you live on. But in the planet I live on, that's five phones and it's mine. It ain't yours and you ain't getting it from me. I don't care what you say. One more time, you soften your voice and you say, dude, you are not listening to me. It isn't real. It's not real. You think it's real, but it's a shadow on a wall. It is not real. By the way, we could prove this pretty quickly, couldn't we? Think about it. We could say, for example, uh, can you eat it? And will it give you any form of nutrition to keep you alive? Well, no. You kind of use it to buy food, but you can't actually eat it. And how about this? What if the old lady had pulled out of her purse a huge wad of $1,000 Monopoly bills? And they fall to the floor. Unless you're like some kind of demon Monopoly player or something, you're probably going to say, crazy whack that old lady, that's like Monopoly money that just fell to the floor. Something is wrong with you. You need to pick up your thousand dollars of Monopoly money. But what about this one? And now you can play the game yourself again back behind, behind the counter. So the money is yours. It's in your pocket. Just a few minutes away from getting off work. Yes, my money. The door rings, and it's the old lady. Again, she comes in, the old lady, only now her limo isn't there. She doesn't have all her jewelry on, and she's got that sweetest, sweetest smile on her face. You know, the old lady smile that's so sweet. You turn around, oh, she ain't alone. She's got somebody with her. This huge guy with the sunglasses on, and she walks in, and she says, Hi, I know you remember me. I was here from before. Yeah. And, you know, we, we, we watched. We watched on the video, you know. That's why there's no 12 on the Maverick clock, so we can watch it. See? Wave. And it's, it's, it's in your pocket. We, we saw it. Nice dance, by the way. Good. Dancing with the stars dance. Good. Am I like, uh, no, no. She says, no, no. I, I, we want you to have the money. Leroy and I. We want you to have the money. But we're going to play a little game. Are you good with games? And you're like, dude, as long as I get the money, I'm great with games. Okay, so here's the game. We're going to let you stay in here and hold that $5,000 for 15 minutes. And then Leroy here, go ahead, show him. Leroy's going to pull out this 45, and he's boom, going to blow your brains all over the Maverick floor. Are you okay with that deal? Uh, now, I've given this lecture a lot of places all over this planet, and I've yet to find anybody that's going to take that trade. Five bones, 15 minutes. And then my brains get splattered all over a maverick floor. But maybe the problem is the currency value. So let's increase the amount. Instead of 5,000, let's say 5 million. Yeah, 5 million. You get to hold 5 million dollars for 15 minutes, and then you're like, boom, it's going to blow your brains out. How many of you want to do that exchange? I ain't found anybody that will go for five. Maybe it's because that ain't enough. How about 5 trillion dollars, five trillion dollars, there you go, you get to hold five trillion dollars. I was doing this gig, I was doing this gig in a, in, a, in a prison once, and it was right about here that that group of 500 or so guys were pretty quiet, and I said this to them, 
dude, do you hear what you are saying? Because I actually asked him. I said, who's going to do that? Who's going to extend, you know, five trillion, you get to hold it 15 minutes, and then boom, you're dead. Nobody puts a hand up. I say, do you hear what you're saying? The next time you question the value of your life, think about what you just said, man. You said you think your life is worth five trillion dollars. That's what you're saying. That's what you're saying. The money isn't real. It's not real. We think it's real, but it ain't real. Hey, come on, let's play this game. That baby owns the Maverick. She's valued in the millions, right? If you could, if you could know she was going to die at midnight, that night, do you honestly think right before she goes, when her heart starts going really fast, and she wakes up realizing, uh-oh, it's done, do you honestly think she'll be worrying about money? See, this is Socrates' insight. It's a brilliant insight. It can change your life if you catch it. Glaucon's trying to. He says it this way. Five seconds before we all flatline, which, by the way, is coming, it's coming. Six, five, four, three, and then you just flatline. It's done. Socrates says we all pretty much say the same thing. We all speak the same words. The words are, oh my God. The only issue is the inflection in the voice. Most people live their life in such a way. That five seconds before it's time to go bye-bye, they say, oh my God, what have I done with my life? The inflection of the voice. Oh, of course, you already know this. Remember the Scrooge story? He's a little bit pissed off, isn't he, when he sees his past. Then when he's shown the present, that, that makes him a little bit more mad. What happens when the third ghost shows him his tombstone? Oh my God, what have I... Okay, I just, I, okay, okay, I just need... just just. I just need one more. Just give me one more. Right? That's the whole point Dickens is making at the end of that story. But Socrates says, you know, there are some people. I mean, honestly, do you think five seconds before he draws his last breath, LeBron James will actually be thinking about basketball? I, he says, I may be wrong, totally wrong about this. I may be. But he says, I kind of have a tendency to think that right before he goes, I, I don't know, maybe... Maybe the founder and an owner of Microsoft, the wealthiest man in the world, he may not be thinking about money. Five seconds before you go, you will be thinking about what's real. At that point, you'll know. You'll know then. There are some people, Socrates, there are some people who live their life in such a way so that five seconds before they go, they say, oh my God, but the inflection of the voice is different. It's like they know it's okay. It's all right. I had to go sooner or later. I've done what I had to do. It's all right. See, the challenge for us is to understand one simple part of this word picture, and it's right there. That is what we call education. That being drug out of the cave, kicking and screaming. Why kicking and screaming? Well, because there's two elements of learning that we constantly forget are ever present. For every serious learning experience, there must be fear and there must be pain. <laughs> I've maybe, uh, maybe told you the story, I'll tell it again. I like to tell it of uh, my kid Mikey. And he's broke. Uh, he wanted to ride a bike. And uh, so I go out. I get him this bike. I bring it home in the back of the pickup truck. There it is. Get it out. Set it down. Mikey's standing there. He's like, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't want those wheels on the back. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. Those are called training wheels. You need to take them off. They make me look like a dumb guy. My pal down the street, he doesn't have those stupid looking wheels. I'm like, son, son, they're training wheels. I'll help you learn how to ride your bike. 
onto the bike he goes, gets ready to fall over. Why do we grab tighter when we're falling? You know? <laughs> Makes no sense at all. The wheels, the wheels catch, and he, then he looks at me, I'm like, see, I told you. Mikey becomes a demon rider on that bike with his training wheels all over the place. I remember the Saturday he comes in, I'm watching ball, he goes, Dad, I say, what? He says, I think it's time I learned my right without my training wheels. I'm like, cool. I don't say anything else. A couple of days later, he comes home with Ma, gets out of the van, and there's Dad standing next to the bike without training wheels. Mikey, whoa, we, whoa, 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 what are you doing? Son, today you're going to learn how to ride your bike without training wheels. Let's go. My Mikey. Uh, no, I don't think today is very, today is not good. Today is definitely not good. I'm like, what do you mean today is not good? Look, it's beautiful outside. And look, Ma's got the camera. It's going to be great. We're going to videotape. It's going to be awesome. Let's go. Let's go. Mikey. Mikey is a scared big time. Big time. He doesn't want to do it. He's like, no, I don't think today is, today's definitely not. I'm like, what's wrong with you? He's like, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to fall. I'm like, oh, son, are you kidding me? We're about to go out here, and we're going to get on this bike, and you're going to ride, and you're going to fall down and jack yourself something awful. It's going to hurt like crazy. Let's go. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? I'm doing this speaking gig down in Houston years ago, and uh, I'm asked in the Q&A uh, about failure, student failure. And I say, oh, I, I deeply respect a student's right to fail. And a mother screams at me, I can't believe you just said that. And I said, you can believe I just said that, and you believe it too. I certainly do not. I said, is that your daughter sitting next to you? It is. I said, can she ride a bike? She can. I said, did you teach her? She said, I did. I said, before you taught her how to ride without her training wheels, did you tell her that she was going to fall down and jack herself and it was going to hurt really bad? Well, no. I said, that sounds like child abuse to me. You knew that the kid was going to be in pain, and you did it anyway? You do believe in it. But see, we all, for, but see, we all, but see, we all forget. See, this is the thing we forget. Mikey out to the front. <laughs> Onto the bike he goes. We got this on video, it's funny. Onto the bike he goes. You know how you do this thing where you grab hold of the seat, the, right? And, and, and I'm kind of, you know how you do this thing right here, you know? And I go, Mikey, he goes, what? And I say, son, I ain't pushing you around the block. You got to pedal. It's like he's totally forgotten how to pedal even. He's so freaked out, right? <laughs> you do this thing, right? Where you like this, pushing, pushing, ready, go, go, go. He starts pedaling, all of a sudden he's doing, oh man, I hope once in your life you get the opportunity to teach somebody how to do this. It's way cool. And let's go. He's right. I'm like, yeah, we're all jumping up and down. But, right, but, you know, right, right, you know, you know it's coming, right? Now let's point out something. My son knew how to use his brakes. He knew. To rotate backwards, that's how you stop. Uh, my son knew about the curb that the city engineer had decided to put right there. He had seen it before. Oh, man, he, I mean, right, bam, oh, over the handle, oh, it's a beautiful jack, elbow, knee, it's awesome, oh, it's beautiful, it's beautiful. I come running up, Mikey is so mad, he is so mad, he's pushed the bike off, he's pulled his little bloody knees up, his little bloody elbow, he is so mad. Uh, he's not mad at Mikey for forgetting how to use his brakes. He's not mad at the city engineer for putting the curb right there. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Stupid jerk, dad. He's mad at me. I come right up. Oh, that was awesome. Oh, what a great chat. Come on, let's do it again. He's mad at me. <laughs> Takes him a couple of days before he finally mounts the courage to get back on the bike. Mikey looks like he's been through the war for the next week and a half <laughs> until he finally learns how to ride that stupid bike. See, here's the thing. All learning environments involve fear and pain. We somehow forget this as we get older, and we want to somehow try to avoid this. Right? We want to avoid this in some way. It's the job of the teacher to remove the training wheels. You will know that you have arrived in your education. You're outside the cave when you no longer need someone to remove your training wheels, when you can do it for yourself, that's when you know you've made it. That's when you know you've made it. We always are dealing with this fear-pain thing. So a student, for example, wants desperately to get the grade. The grade, so important, the grade, that she actually will decide to cheat. And I come up and I say, what are you doing? <laughs> that grade, it's not real. <laughs> it isn't real. 
Yes, it is. I'll get in all kinds of trouble if I don't have... You're not hearing me. Five seconds before you flatline, you won't care what your grades were. You'll only care what you learned. <laughs> Wisdom for Socrates. Defined as the capacity to see the moment of your death before it occurs. Everyone knows this five seconds before he or she flatlines. The question is, can you know it before five seconds? What would it be like to live your life in such a way so that the images on the wall of the cave, right? Beautiful bodies, right? Somehow matter less than the real concepts of beauty. Right? I sometimes get asked this question. It's a perennial question, right? Um, what about that whole thing of knowing if I'm really in love? Simple question. Plato's answer is a really simple one. He says, if you spend all your time looking at the stuff on that box right there, the stuff that will not last, the stuff that is ultimately shadows, your relationship will not last. It won't. Dude, how do you account for the fact that the two most beautiful people in all of the world could not stay married? Brad Pitt and his wife, Jennifer Aniston. Come on, by all accounts, everybody says, most beautiful. If physical, think about it. See, this is where all of a sudden this word picture goes, I'll be damned, he's right, Socrates, he's right. If physical bodies, beautiful bodies, were the basis for long-term relationship, those guys would have it forever. Would you agree? Socrates says, though, there are some people who get it. The money drops on the floor, and if you had the right education... You say to the old lady, uh oh lady, who thinks she's somehow better than me because she has money and she owns a company. You dropped five bones on the floor. <laughs> it ain't real. I know you think it's real. It ain't real. And I know tonight at five seconds before midnight you were to go, it wouldn't be this you'd be thinking about. But it's yours. You need your money back. I'm really happy to help you have it back because I don't want it, because I don't need it, because it isn't real. I know it's not real. I'm kind of sad you don't know it's not real. Watch how, this, watch how this word picture works really well for Glaucon. The next time somebody's mean to you, the next time somebody says something nasty about you, all you have to do is remember that individual is sitting locked in a cave, chained up. She doesn't know. She doesn't know. There's no point in jacking her up or hitting her or being mean to her. She's stuck in a cave. She thinks that saying something mean to you really can affect you. Right? Just like when we were saying with the Thrasymachan argument. The guy walks through the door and says, this is what we're going to do. And you say, no, we're not. Boom, blow you away. The next guy, this is what we're going to do. And everybody goes, okay. But what if the next person goes, no. No, I'm not. Because here's why. You actually think that 12-gauge ends me. <laughs> it's almost funny. You think you can somehow kill this? Well, yeah, of course you can kill that. Everyone knows that. But there's this other thing. <laughs> you can't touch that. No 12-gauge touches that. <laughs> Notice how fear goes away all of a sudden. This will be the point of the Phaedo. Socrates is ready to drink his hemlock. All of his students are crying. They're sad. He's like, what is wrong with you? Well, you're about to die. And he's like, have you not been listening? What is wrong with you guys? I, I, I'm happy. He's singing songs and everything. He's like writing poems, getting ready to go. And they're all like, what is wrong with you? You're like actually happy that you think you're about to leave. And he's like, why wouldn't I be happy? It's another journey. Did you honestly think my body would last forever? Do you not?